Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to day two of the 2017 Global Education Conference. We're so glad that you're here. We're delighted to have our first keynote of the day by Ariel Tickner Wagner. Ariel, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I want to be a senior fellow. How does one get such a title? <laughs> well, you'll hear in just a few minutes. How <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> nice. Thanks to our sponsors and supporters. We especially express appreciation to participate. Long time supporter of the Cutter Foundation, first time this year. Delighted to have them on board. Digital Promise Global. Taking it global, now our fiscal partner. And we really appreciate them and all that they do. This is your chance to indicate where you're participating from. Look to the left of the map. You're going to click on the star icon. Click on it twice. And then click on the map. Some of you went fast. You knew exactly what to do. And then put a shout out in the chat. Let us know where you're, where you are. Maybe the time and the temperature. Guam, 1 a.m. I wondered if that was a, an actual link there. Thomas, welcome. Thank you for being here. 20 degrees in Vermont. So keep those notes coming in the chat, but we are going to move the slides forward. Um, Ariel, before you begin, I'm going to bring Lucy Gray on, our co-chair, uh, and have Lucy talk a little bit about our relationship with your organization. Good morning, everyone, or at least it is here in Chicago. I'm Lucy Gray, and I am Steve's co-chair for the conference, and I'm so happy to have you all join us today for a very special presentation. We first met Ariel at the COSIN conference here in Chicago last year. We uh, helped COSIN host their international symposium, and again, it will ha be happening again this year in Washington, D.C. in March, if anybody's interested. And uh, we met Ariel and we started talking and we're so pleased to have ASCD uh, partner with us now on our annual Global Leadership Summit. We have done these events, uh, which are face-to-face -face events, for the past two years. In 2016, we did it at Edmodo's headquarters in California. And last year, we did it at IIE in New York City and Ariel was there as well. That was, both events were really special. And this year, uh, we'll be in Boston and doing this as a precursor to um, Empower 18, which is ASCD's annual um, event. So it's going to be really amazing. We have panel discussions in the morning, Ignite talks, and roundtable discussions in the afternoon. And they will focus on some of the things that um, Errol is going to talk about today. And Ariel can probably tell us who's confirmed to be on the panels, but it's pretty much an all-star lineup, I think. So if you are interested in networking um, with some of the people who've been at our conference over the years, if you're interested in helping your school or district go global um, and, and really empower leadership, this is the event for you. So it will be happening March 23rd in Boston. And I'll put the link again in the chat if you're interested in attending. Hopefully, we'll also have it streaming, but um, you know we're we're working on those kinds of details. So um, thank you, Ariel, for all the hard work you've done on this, and I know it's going to be an outstanding event, and we're looking forward to it. Yeah, and me as well. Um, yeah, so thank you, uh, Lucy and Steve, for bringing ASCD into your uh, global education network. Um, I'm really thrilled and humbled to be working with you um, and to be presenting uh, here today as part of the 8th Annual Global Education Conference. Uh, so good morning, good afternoon, or good evening um, to um, all those who are here today. Um, you know, I, I'm just, again, so grateful uh, to be able to present today. I think the time is always urgent to make sure that all of our students um, 
are prepared and empowered to really create the future that they want to see um, and make the world a more equitable, inclusive, and sustainable place to live. Um, and I really believe that more urgently than ever, we, you know, as a collective humanity, need to be empathetic, uh, critical thinkers, problem solvers, and cross-cultural collaborators. And uh, the Global Education Conference is, is such a, a great opportunity to bring educators together from all over the world um, in working to achieve that mission. Uh, so today, um, I'm going to be talking um, about globally competent teaching. Um, and as the title of my uh, presentation suggests, um, I really do believe, and I'll make the argument today, uh, that globally competent teaching is truly the key uh, to cultivating global citizens. Um, but before I kind of dive into the meat of the presentation, I do want to give just a brief introduction um, of who, I, who I am and what my global education journey has been. Um, so I believe or I began my career um, as a fifth and sixth grade teacher out in Phoenix, Arizona, where most of my students were either immigrants or children of immigrants. And so from the get-go of my career um, and throughout my uh, time as a researcher and a doctoral candidate and now as a, a senior fellow at ASCG, I've always been guided by the question, what are the best um, educational practices and policies uh, that promote the academic, social, and emotional outcomes of all students um, so that all students are able you know, to thrive in a diverse and interconnected world? Um, and I do believe that globally competent teaching is the answer to that. Um, and at ASCD, in my role now as senior fellow, I have the opportunity uh, to really support educators in this work. Um, so real quickly, <clears throat> um, I do want to share kind of, you know, who ASCD is and what we're about. Um, so our mission is all about supporting the whole child. Uh, we're an educator organization um, committed uh, to leading, learning, and teaching uh, so that every child is healthy, safe, engaged, supported, and challenged. So ultimately, we support educators in supporting the whole child. We are also um, a global organization. We have 115,000 members from all over the world, representing 128 countries. Um, in addition to that, we have 51 affiliates all over the world as well. And what makes ASCD unique um, is that we do have um, representation um, from educators in all sorts of roles. We have teacher members, principal members, uh, district administrators, superintendents, uh, folks from higher education, um, and other education stakeholders as well. And so recently, over the past two years, um, one of our five areas of focus um, in supporting the whole child has been global engagement. Um, and so we define global engagement at ASCD as preparing children for an interconnected global society um, and engaging educators from all over the world to connect around crucial issues facing education. And we're trying to infuse global engagement, and we are, um, across all of our programs, products, and services. So for example, conferences and institutes, so the Global Leadership Summit that we'll be hosting as a precursor to Empower 18 is one example of that. Uh, digital learning, advocacy, publishing, professional learning on site, um, in our communities as well, including our affiliates. Um, so today, um, I do want to talk about uh, three big questions. The why, the what, and the how of globally competent teaching. Uh, so today we're going to answer why does globally competent teaching matter, what does globally competent teaching look like, and how do teachers develop global competence. Um, but before I work on answering those questions, um, I'd like to throw some questions back to you. Uh, so if everyone could just kind of think for a minute about what makes someone a global citizen. So if global citizenship is the outcome, right, that we want our education system, uh, to produce in students and to cultivate in students, what does that look like? What is a global citizen? So think about it, and then if you want to type it in the chat box. You know, what is it that you see? What is it um, that you hear? What are the attributes that make someone a global citizen? And please feel free to type in the chat box. Sorry, to so be collaborating with um, other countries' people, open-mindedness, Curiosity, empathetic, critical thinking, right, respectful of different views and cultures, having someone else's perspective, motivation, compassionate, understanding different perspectives, right, addressing issues that affect the whole world, so transcending those kind of geographic divides, engagement, 
to understanding with our people outside of our own existence, ability to see the humanity of others, taking action. All right, these are all great. So please take a minute to keep scrolling through to see what everyone else is writing. So if this is the ultimate outcome, global citizenship, let's now take a step back and think about what does the classroom environment look like that helps cultivate um, these outcomes in students? So if you walk into a classroom that's global and a classroom that's committed, uh, to producing global citizens or fostering global citizenships in students. What do you see when you walk into that classroom? What do you hear? What does it look like? So think about it and then type in your answers. All right, I'm seeing some answers coming in now. Um, eager to learn from others, students from different backgrounds, deep conversations about real world issues, discussing different cultural perspectives, right, interaction and reflection from those who are different, a disposition for dialogue and discussion, all are welcome and supported, a respect for diversity, identity awareness, engaging, All right, so essentially what people are writing, and you can please feel free to continue to type in your thoughts on what makes the classroom global. Um, but the big question that we're going to answer right now is what makes a teacher globally competent? Um, so essentially, you know, the answers that, that I'm seeing come through pretty much, you know, sum up uh, what I'm about to share with you today about kind of what are these different aspects of, of globally competent teachers. What they do, right, is they, they create the environment um, that allow what you type in to show. Um, and so that, that's really the what and the crux of what we're after today, and it's these teachers right, and educators right, in the school who really are the ones that facilitate this uh, learning environment. So as I said, the first part um, of, the, of the presentation I hope to discuss is really why focus on teachers. Um, and the answer to me is simple, um, though, as this slide may imply, and maybe it's a bit complex as well, uh, but teachers truly are the gatekeepers to global citizenship education. Um, so the slide that you see now is busy, and, and it's meant to be that way. Um, so our education systems, no matter where we live, what country we live in, they're highly complex, um, and there's many different levers from that, that can produce change into the system. So if our goal if, that we're all here today for is to better infuse global citizenship education into our education system so that we graduate students who are uh, globally aware, globally confident, and ultimately consider themselves to be uh, global citizens. Uh, there's so many different kind of entryways, right, that we can dive into to produce that change. There's national or federal policy, state or provincial policy, uh, local education agencies, uh, there's even school policies, right, all that work towards impacting what happens in the classroom. Uh, there's also, you know, different arenas outside of the education system that can effectively um, change uh, classroom instruction so that students do become more globally aware and ultimately identify as global citizens. So there are NGOs, many of whom are actually represented at this conference this week, who are doing incredible work around global citizenship education. Other uh, supranational organizations, for example, UNESCO, um, that's put out great white papers and has held kind of great summits and convenings around global citizenship education. Uh, universities have a role to play as well, particularly around teacher training and preparation. Students' families. Um, can also contribute to their global citizenship learning, um, you know, along with philanthropies and those outside of the public sector who fund education initiatives. Um, so all of these arenas, right, are places that if we're committed to global citizenship education, we can tap into to produce change. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, when students are learning, they're learning in a classroom with a teacher. Uh, so teachers truly are, right, the gatekeepers, uh, to instruction and practice that, um, that that leads to global citizenship. And students spend, and so there's, there's data, uh, oh, and I like that. So we have someone saying, I would replace the word gatekeeper to facilitator. 
Yes, and I agree that, right, so teachers are ultimately facilitators in the classroom, but teachers are also the ones who, who interpret, right, all these different programs and policies that come into place, um, that come into place. So um, teachers, right, then they, they, they're these interpreters, facilitators, uh, whatever term you want to say, right, for a number of different reasons. So one, when students are at school, right, they spend the bulk of their time with a teacher, and it can be up to half of their waking hours. So um, in the U.S., for example, students are with teachers for about 400 minutes a day. And so that's a lot of time that definitely adds up. Um, teachers are also uh, the number one school-related predictor of student success. So if we can build capacity in teachers, to really teach for global citizenship and teach the global competencies that students need to thrive in a diverse world, um, we can really um, we can really impact by kind of the, the outcomes that we hope to see in students. However, at the same time, uh, teachers more often than not today enter classrooms not prepared um, to teach for global citizenship, and this is for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of times teacher education programs and teacher preparation programs don't have the opportunities um, to address a global education um, in, in pre-service instruction. Um, and along with that, there's research, particularly in the U.S., that shows that teacher education programs can be some of the least internationalized on campus. Um, so this includes uh, policies and programs that take into account uh, teachers taking a foreign language, studying abroad, um, and actual exposure to international subjects. Um, so, when we talk about any policy program or initiative um, focused on global education and changing instructional practices to promote global education, we have to make sure that these programs and policies take into account teachers' professional learning. Right? So, ultimately, all to say, teachers matter um, and teachers as leaders in the global education movement matter. So that's kind of the why, the why that we focus on teachers today. Um, and I will say as well, kind of just you know, to back up in a second, that um, that there are great islands of excellence, and there are great teacher education programs that are promoting global citizenship. Um, but these tend to be kind of more of the exception rather than the norm um, in teacher education. Um, so when we talk about globally competent teaching. Right, this is really the what that we're after. What does this look like? Um, so about five years ago, this question, what does globally competent teaching look like, uh, prompted um, myself and a team of researchers at the University of North Carolina uh, to really dive into this question and think about, and think about what are the actual tangible, concrete elements uh, that make globally competent teaching come alive. Uh, so for those, um, you know, who, who have been in the field of global education for a while, you're probably well aware that there's no one clear text definition. If you ask any two people what global education means or what global citizenship means, you're going to get some slightly different answers, so they, you know, tend to coalesce around the same main theme. Um, you know, same within the field itself, and I've, I'm already guilty of this in this presentation, right, there's really no kind of one solid terminology that we use. We might say global competence, global awareness, global literacy, uh, global citizenship. So uh, we really wanted to kind of just put down in writing kind of what are the key elements um, of globally competent teaching that a teacher can actually look at, hang their hat on, and take um, implementable actions towards. Um, so what we did to answer these questions is we uh, reviewed a whole lot of literature. We conducted a systematic literature review of over a hundred articles and a hundred or over a hundred articles and um, and kind of organizational documents and white papers as well um, of leaders in the field of global education uh, to kind of come together with the common definition of the dispositions, knowledge, and skills that globally competent teachers have. And so we came across these and I'll quickly read them out loud and then I'll dive into some examples of what these look like. Um, so dispositions include empathy and valuing multiple perspectives and a commitment to equity worldwide. Uh, globally competent teaching knowledge involves an understanding of global conditions and current events, um, understanding ways that the world is interconnected, um, an experiential understanding of multiple cultures, an understanding of intercultural communication. Uh, skills really involve kind of the pedagogy, so thinking about teachers, um, as professionals, um, and what does it take for them to kind of impart 
uh, these globally competent dispositions and knowledge into teacher practice. Um, so this includes the ability to uh, communicate in multiple languages, so uh, being able to create a classroom environment that values diversity and global engagement, integrating content-aligned explorations of the world, uh, facilitating international and intercultural conversations that promote active listening, perspective recognition, and critical thinking, uh, developing local, national, and international partnerships that promote content-aligned uh, real-world learning experiences, um, and finally, uh, developing um, assessments for uh, students' global competence learning. Um, and these can also kind of be divided into three main buckets um, of, of, of knowledge or attributes, you can say. So those who are familiar um, with UNESCO's uh, framework for global citizenship education, uh, this might look familiar, because um, these elements of globally competent teaching kind of do fall under the cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral domains. Um, so cognitive includes uh, this kind of global, global interdependence, which is really an understanding of the world and infusing global content and perspectives into curriculum, instruction, and assessment. Um, this second main bucket involves social emotional learning. Um, so being able to empathize with those whose backgrounds, experiences, cultures, and perspectives might differ from your own in creating an environment uh, that fosters kind of empathy and perspective recognition among students. Um, and the third bucket is behavioral. Um, so teachers are able to make uh, global connections and are able to collaborate and take action on a global level. Um, and it's really important to emphasize uh, that this is embedded into what teachers are already teaching. Yes, this can be included in a distinct uh, global, a global studies course or global unit, but really um, these attributes and these elements of globally competent teaching are designed to be spiraled throughout the year um, into whatever subject you're teaching, whether it's language arts, Spanish, French, science, math, uh, you name it, right, arts. Uh, th these competencies are meant for every teacher of every grade level um, and don't necessarily need to be incorporated into every single lesson that you teach, but again, are something that students are constantly exposed to throughout the year. Um, so now I'm going to take a few minutes um, to kind of discuss, okay, so I see this question, how do teachers find time with curriculum and imposed framework? Yes, yeah, so that's exactly why these are meant to be embedded into the curriculum and framework that teachers already have to operate in. Um, because if we go back, right, to that, one of the first slides I showed of all those kind of embedded contexts that teachers are operating in, right, we can't ignore the fact that there is policy uh, that oftentimes, depending on your context, prescribes what it is you have to teach, and in some instances, when you have to teach it. And so, um, and so by infusing these global competencies into uh, classroom instruction and into the content that you're already teaching, that helps kind of answer that question of how do teachers do this given time constraints. All right. So now I'm going to um, give some time just for a minute to kind of talk about what these look like in practice. Again, so answering the what of what is globally competent teaching. Um, so when we talk about this bucket of local global interdependence, um, teachers are able to understand global conditions and current events by showing both an awareness of the world um, and their place in it. So again, this is kind of a basic awareness of geography, global conditions, and current events, but then being able to understand why these uh, global conditions and current events are occurring. So what are kind of the social, political, economic, historical, and cultural influences that's making the world, right, and the current events that we're reading about in the headlines what they are? Uh, teachers are also able to kind of see these events from different perspectives. Um, so for example, on the middle school English language arts teacher that I worked with, she had her students choose a current event um, and then track it from multiple news outlets. So they had a report on what this current event looked like from three distinct news outlets and then articulate why um, those stories were portrayed in very different ways depending on who the author was and, and what the outlet represented. Um, you know, another important aspect of a local global interdependence is teachers being able to understand um, how, um, how the world is interconnected. Um, so really understanding how your personal actions and how your local community um, kind of 
makes that can make impacts on communities um, around the world. And understanding too that the world is not just something that's out there to explore, but that you actually are a part of it. So when you're talking about global education, you're also talking about yourself. Um, and so Project Zero um, out of Harvard um, has these great global thinking routines um, that help students and teachers for that matter do just that. Um, so for example, one of the global thinking routines um, asks, asks teachers and students to think about why, whatever, whatever topic you're discussing, right? Why does this matter to me? Why does this matter uh, to my community? And why does this matter to the larger world? Um, so being able to kind of articulate that um, and then to break down kind of, you know, why why it is that global um, interdependence um, is, is happening um, and some of the inequities um, that can be a part of it as well. Um, so teachers then are also able, from kind of the professional perspective, uh, to be able to integrate content-aligned explorations of the world. So again, this goes back to that issue of time and curriculum. Uh, so globally competent teachers um, can take whatever um, their content area is and figure out how to infuse a global perspective in it. Um, so, you know, at kind of the very, you know, basic beginner level, uh, say you're teaching math, uh, you know, you can have your word problems take place in different parts of the world. You're teaching science, a unit on volcanoes, you can show volcanoes in different parts of the world. And that just begins to build that, that basic global awareness. Uh, when you get to more advanced levels, of course, right, we're talking about real explorations, student-centered inquiry-based learning. Uh, so where students are actually um, you know, designing their own design challenges or project-based initiatives uh, focused on a global topic. For example, uh, refugee resettlement um, or water crises. And then, yes, we live in a world where what we measure matters. And so another important feature um, of globally competent teaching is being able to assess students' um, global confidence and particularly their ability to make those global connections. Uh, so as one example, a science teacher I recently spoke to said how, you know, on their rubric for science project, they actually have added to it a global connections piece. So where, where students have to articulate why the project or the, the topic that they're, that they're discussing connects on a much more global level. So the second main bucket uh, that I discussed of globally confident teaching um, is empathy and perspective recognition. And this really boils down uh, to culturally responsive practices. Um, so really making sure that each and every one of your students, no matter where they're from, uh, no matter their, their cultural, uh, racial, ethnic, uh, linguistic background, feels like they are welcome in the school and can see themselves in the curriculum. And this really begins with an understanding of our own biases and where we come from, and understanding that we all have a culture, um, you know, no matter who we are, that kind of shapes, um, you know, our perceptions and perspectives of the world. Um, so you can kind of see here um, in this picture, uh, the first grade teacher who I worked with, uh, she had all of her students, and she did this herself, create a culture pie. So they created these different slices of kind of what makes up a culture. Um, and then have their students write them in. So each student at the beginning of the year right, was able to articulate who they were and where they're and where they come from. Um, and that they were able to see, you know, from one another that, oh yeah, kind of, you know, we do come from different places. We do have different uh, beliefs that are informed by our culture. And that and that's just someone in these are students in first grade. Um, you know, another example too in thinking about culture um, as a teacher, right, is kind of how our culture informs our education um, our perceptions of education. Um, so um, I remember just one quick example. When I was a teacher, um, one of my students, he was an immigrant from Mexico, and he would always hand in his math homework only with the answers. And as a teacher, I would always say, show all your work, show all your work, show all your work, because I wanted to see, if, you know, if, when they were doing long division, if there was an area where they, you know, possibly, you know, messed up along the way, and if they, you know, had that a wrong answer. You know, but he always, right, erased, 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 and only, only showed his exact answer. So it comes to pass that when I talked to his mom about it, his mom said, oh, no, like, where I went to school when I grew up, like, that this would be messy and disrespectful. Like, why would I have my son, like, show off his scribbles on his homework? So, again, me being able to take a step back as a teacher and understand, okay, like, my culture has informed my, my teaching practice, and people who have different educational experiences, right, they're going to, their culture is going to kind of inform the work that they turn in, and that can prevent, you know, cultural um, misunderstandings when it comes to even working with your students. Um, so one way of really kind of, you know, getting at your own biases um, and where you and where you come from um, is through actually experiencing different cultures. Um, so an important aspect of 
kind of building this empathy piece is being able to have experiential understandings of multiple cultures. Um, so globally competent teachers seek out these different cultural experiences. Um, it can be, you know, studying abroad um, or teaching abroad, but, it, you know, it can also be as simple as exploring um, other, you know, just another religious institution that, that you've never gone to in your community, for example. Um, and really important when it comes to kind of understanding and exploring other cultures is to embed that reflection piece in. So before you go, uh, globally company teachers tend to, tend to reflect on what their culture is. Um, they reflect throughout the immersion process and then reflect when they come back as well. Um, and that's all to say, right, that when teachers are able to develop uh, this value for multiple perspectives and an understanding and value for different cultures, they're able to create a classroom environment uh, that values diversity and global engagement. So when you walk into these classrooms, and people have already, you know, written this as well, um, you know, you kind of see resources from all over the world, and you see different cultures are presented. But not only that, but you see students and teachers actually engaging with these resources. So they're just not a pretty picture on the wall, but there's something that's part and parcel to their learning. And when you walk into these uh, classroom environments that value diversity and global engagement, um, you also you also see um, you also see and you hear students talking in a way uh, that truly shows kind of a, a, res a respectful dialogue. Uh, so you'll hear sentence screams, for example, like "I think this because of this," or "I disagree about what you're saying. Can you please explain, you know, your thought process behind this?" Um, so you hear a diversity of student opinion, and you hear that diversity of opinion being respected. Um, and finally, um, that third bucket um, of globally competent teaching focuses on global connections, collaboration, and action. Um, and so this involves uh, facilitating international and intercultural conversations um, and partnerships that promote real-world context for global learning opportunities. Uh, so this can include Skype and video chats, facilitating international exchanges, both you know, bringing students abroad, but also hosting um, international students as well, um, bringing speakers into your school from your local community that might represent diverse backgrounds or, or who might work in a global context and can provide um, experiences around that. Um, and an important aspect, again, of global connection and collaboration does involve um, intercultural communication. Uh, so teachers are able to articulate um, and really understand how uh, culture is so embedded in language and how language is embedded in identity um, so, that, so that teachers respect um, students' linguistic backgrounds and the linguistic backgrounds of their families um, and are also able to um, communicate in multiple languages and make efforts to communicate uh, with students and families uh, from different um, linguistic backgrounds from them as well. So, I know that was a lot. <laughs> um, and, you know, globally competent teaching is complex. It's multifaceted. Uh, so, of course, you know, the big question is how? How do we get there, right? How can we, you know, jump into and delve into these cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral domains um, in a way that's not completely, right, overwhelming given all the other demands that teachers face? Um, so, um, to prepare global citizens really kind of involves taking a step back and first understanding that there's no one way to do it and there's no one right way to do it either. Um, you know, you can begin with perhaps, um, you know, making um, global connections for your students. Maybe you're someone who has a really wide, um, you know, global professional learning network, so it's easy for you um, to begin to connect your students with other classrooms abroad. Um, you know, maybe you, you start with your students yourself. You walk into your classroom and you know that you have students that represent um, cultures um, from all over the world um, and unique cultures within your own community. And that's where the starting place is for you. Um, so it's a unique journey for each educator that depends both upon their lo your local context um, and also kind of your own uh, past uh, personal and professional experiences. Um, so that being said, it's really important um, when you're starting this journey of developing these global competencies that I just went over, um, it's really vital to understand where you're starting from. What are your strengths? What are your challenges? And why? Um, and it's also really important, right, to um, understand, again, kind of your context. Um, so maybe, right, you're concerned with educating newcomer students to your school. 
Um, maybe you're concerned about the fact that you teach in a remote, isolated area and you have yet to expose your students um, to perspectives and cultures that are different from you. So you can start from vastly different places, but before beginning, you have to understand where it is that you're taking that first step from. Then, kind of once you recognize where you're from, right, it's all about taking small measured steps. So it's not about trying to do all of this at once, um, but it's understanding what can I do next so that I can begin to improve um, and improve the education that my students are receiving. So really understanding that global confidence does not develop overnight um, is something that develops over a lifetime. And um, we have a tool that really helps you do that. Uh, so the Globally Competent Learning Continuum, um, which can be found at globallearning.asdd.org. Um, both defines those elements of globally competent teaching um, that, that I went over, um, and it also allows you to kind of self-reflect um, on where you are so you can grow as a professional. Um, so it's twofold. It's both a self-assessment tool that's designed for reflection and professional growth to help teachers develop uh, those 12 disposition knowledge and skill elements uh, that I just shared. It also provides an online resource library um, with articles, books, blogs, websites, uh, lesson plans, classroom videos, um, and links to, um, and links to uh, you know, a variety of other resources as well, um, all in the spirit um, of helping you improve. Um, so it's designed for classroom teachers of all grade levels in all subject areas, uh, whether you're pre-K, whether you teach high school, whether you teach math, whether you teach social studies, because um, again, it's all kind of predicated on the idea that global learning can be embedded into whatever it is that you're teaching and spiraled throughout the year. Um, and while it's designed for um, individual classroom teachers uh, to self-reflect on their own level of global confidence, it can also be used by school administrators, professional development providers, uh, global learning cohort leaders, um, teacher educators, by anyone that's providing uh, professional learning um, or global education services to teachers or to students um, so that they can think about how their program is helping build the capacity of teachers to prepare global citizens. Um, and very exciting, um, in 2018, um, we'll also be launching um, an online portfolio um, so teachers can individually sign on, uh, take the self-assessment, um, save the results, and track their progress over time. And it'll also have an administrative function uh, so say you are a school principal that wants your entire school um, to really focus on global learning, or maybe you're leading um, a global PLC, or maybe you are a professional development provider that, that focuses on this work, um, you, could administrator, you can administer it to the teachers with whom you work, um, and you can kind of look at progress um, as an aggregate. Um, and that's really important that you can't look at individual scores, because I cannot reiterate enough that this tool um, was developed and designed as a, a tool for um, self-reflection and not external evaluation. Um, so resources will also, I should add as well, um, be, um, be continuously updated as well. Um, so if ever you have new, great, ideally free resources, uh, you can always send them my way. Um, because this is, again, meant to be like a resource repository as well. Um, so I'll just really quickly kind of talk about the development and validation of this tool um, before showing you what it's all about. Um, so it was developed by myself, uh, Montana, Montana Kane, Jocelyn Glazier, Hillary Perko, um, as a part of a project uh, out of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and has since been adopted by ASCD. It was developed in support of some uh, funding by the Longview Foundation um, and with in-kind support from Learn and See and Worldview. Um, and it went through iterative phases of research and development, um, beginning with that systematic literature review. Uh, then it was evaluated by uh, teacher practitioners. It was evaluated um, via surveys and focus groups uh, through expert review as well. Um, and then it was tested as a pilot. So this went through almost a, a two-year process um, of development and validation, which I'm always happy to provide additional details for. But I'll just say this is research-based and, again, validated as a tool for teacher self-reflection and professional growth. Um, so here's what it looks like. Um, so for each of the 12 elements, um, there are five levels that go from nascent um, all the way up to advanced. Um, and so how to use it is quite simple. You simply, for each element, kind of read through each level um, and decide 
where, you know, where you see yourself and reflect on the line. Um, so a few things kind of about these bubbles. Um, they kind of fall under these three philosophical underpinnings. So one is this idea that as you move along the continuum, you're moving from kind of an inward to an outward look. So when you're a nascent and beginning, you're really, you know, understanding your own biases and beliefs um, before you're able to kind of understand other perspectives of others. Uh, likewise, you become aware of your own culture first, right, before you begin to explore other cultures. Um, a second main premise is the idea of going from personal action to communal action. Um, so at the beginning, particularly when you dive into the, um, the globally competent teaching skills, right, it's all about first teachers taking action to guide their students' learning. Um, then by the time you get to advanced, you're really just facilitating students as they're leading their own instruction. Um, so, it, but same with uh, the commitment to promoting equity worldwide, right? You start by kind of beginning that, um, beginning to kind of recognize inequities yourself and taking action yourself, and then by the time you get to advance, you're leading students to take action um, on issues that they deem important. And the third main premise, again, goes from this idea of awareness um, to really thinking critically about the world that we live in. So, Beginning to, for example, um, when it comes to a commitment to equity worldwide, uh, beginning from the premise of simply understanding and recognizing that inequities exist, um, then seeking to understand kind of the underlying reasons why these inequities are happening. Um, you know, same with um, local global connections. So beginning at the beginning, you're understanding, you know, that the world is interconnected and how actions you take might have a global impact. Um, but by the time you're advanced, you're actually thinking about how global interconnectedness might contribute uh, to inequities within and across nations. So along with um, along with that continuum with those five developmental levels that you can rate yourself on, we also have a resource library. So for each element of globally competent teaching, um, we are continuously compiling um, examples of books, book chapters, articles, uh, classroom videos, lesson plans, um, and links um, to other external websites as well um, that can help you kind of move along the continuum for whatever element you're looking at. Um, so right now these are labeled, if you go to the website at globallearning.asd.org, uh, you can find this resource repository um, under the competencies tab. Um, and I think what's really exciting too, I'll add, is about these videos. Um, is that, again, they, they represent a cross-section of teachers uh, from elementary school, middle school, and high school, and really represent teachers of all grade levels. Um, so whether you're, and same with, the, same with the reading and articles as well, right? It's not just geared towards social studies teachers or language teachers. It's geared towards all teachers um, across different um, subject areas. Um, and so when you're looking at any of these resources, you can explore and ask yourself, right, what did I learn? from this and what can I do to modify um, and try in my classroom tomorrow. So it's all about kind of just not only understanding where you are, but understanding how you can move forward and have the resources to move forward to improve your practice. Um, so to use the continuum is pretty simple, right? So first you take that um, step of reflection, so you self-assess along the continuum for each element. Based on your reflection, you decide what is it that I want to work on, where are my strengths that I can continue to move forward with, where are the challenges that I really want to kind of hone in on. Um, once you identify that, the, the challenge areas that you have and the areas for improvement, you can review some resources, you can read some articles, you can, um, you know, explore different uh, teaching abroad options, uh, you can explore different professional learning opportunities, watch videos of classroom teachers in practice, um, and then take some action yourself. Um, so you, you can decide, all right, based on the video I watched, I'm going to try to um, infuse a global perspective in this way in my science class. And you'll try it out, you'll implement it, and then after time, you can go back and reflect again. So retake the self-assessment and decide, did I improve, did I move along, why or why not? Um, so in essence, this is really all about continuous improvement um, and constant reflection of practice which is really just good teacher professional development and teacher learning. So I want to make sure that we have time um, for questions, but I do want to end um, just by sharing um, a little bit about kind of the different pathways that you can take uh, to developing global confidence. 
So as I've said before, and I'll continue to reiterate again, um, every journey is different for every educator. Um, everyone starts at their own starting place. Um, perhaps, right, you were born a global citizen. You've traveled the world your whole life. Perhaps this is the first time you're thinking, right, about um, infusing a global perspective into your teaching practice. Wherever it is that you're coming from, there's going to be a unique pathway for you. Um, so these are just kind of a few different pathways um, that my colleagues and I have identified uh, through the research that we've done um, with practicing teachers, again, from K-12 across different subject areas. Um, so this includes international travel experiences. Um, you know, there's numerous fellowships that are out there for teachers, um, and there's also ways that you can kind of do it yourself. Um, but again, the most effective uh, pathways or the most effective uh, international experiences, right, are those that are really, um, that really emphasize immersion and constant reflection throughout those journeys. Um, you know, you can also create your own global professional learning network. Um, the Global Education Conference is a great way of doing so. <laughs> so you guys are, whoever's here, right, you're kind of already on that path already. Um, so just continue to reach out to colleagues around the world um, to make those global connections. Um, and through those connections, you'll kind of see a domino effect of how your own globally competent teaching is enhanced. Um, there's, you can learn from students and families within your own community. So again, taking the time to listen to your students and to listen to their perspectives and experiences can really, um, you know, open your world. Um, but I do want to emphasize with that, that when you are, you know, learning from your students, particularly students that might come from different cultures or might be coming from different countries, um, it's always important to remember never uh, to ask them to be the spokesperson for their culture or their country. Um, or their religion, for that matter, right? Um, students, right? Students represent their own perspectives on that culture. Um, and, you know, there is the danger of a single story, so it's always important to remember that, that students cannot be the spokesperson for an entire nation or an entire culture. Um, and finally, um, there's school-based PLCs. Um, so a lot of times, right, it can be hard to go out this alone, um, but, if, but if you're working uh, with a dedicated group of colleagues, um, it might be your grade level, um, it could be um, interdisciplinary, it might be disciplinary. Uh, there's many different ways to go about it, but where you can kind of, in your job, um, focus together on how we embed these different elements of global competence. Um, and I'll leave you with this quote, uh, the journey of a thousand miles uh, begins with a single step. Um, so my very first week of teaching, uh, my teacher mentor gave me a bookmark that had this quote, um, and I always continue to go back to it, and I think it's particularly relevant um, when we're talking about globally competent teaching, um, because it does take a lot, um, and there's a lot involved, um, but I think it's always important to remember um, to take a deep breath um, and just begin with kind of that next step forward. Um, and that's how the continuum was really designed, and just the way for teachers to, to take this, this huge, important concept and really break it down um, so that you can just say, okay, this is the next step I can take um, towards improving um, my students' global citizenship and improving, ultimately, uh, the world. So um, with that, um, I do want to open it up for questions. Um, so if people want to type their questions in, All right, so someone is saying, um, I'm not an ASCG member. Can I access the articles that you refer to in your presentation? Absolutely. So if you click on, when you go to the Global Learning um, website and the Globally Competent Learning Continuum, it's a free resource, um, which is very intentional because uh, we know how, <laughs> how hard it is for educators to get resources sometimes. Um, most of the resources on the page, uh, the articles, well, some of them are unlocked, so you don't have to be a member to access. Um, some you can get previews for. Um, but you would have to pay, so that, that does depend on the specific article, um, but a number of them are unlocked if you are not a member. Other questions? All right, so if people want to think about other questions or maybe um, other resources that, and it looks like there is kind of a robust conversation going on in the chat um, that, that I missed, but, you know, we can um, take the time, too, to share, like, are there other resources that, that 
you all have that you think can kind of help support these elements is be a great place to share with one another as well. Okay, and while you're thinking of any questions too, um, I will put in a final plug um, for the Global Leadership Summit. Uh, so this uh, summit um, is taking place, um, as Lucy mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, um, March 23rd, 2018. I'll be an all-day event, um, and ASCD is so excited to be partnering um, with the Global Education Conference Network um, to, um, to host this summit. Um, the really just like why go, um, it's about learning and networking with innovative and inspiring teachers, principals, district leaders, thought leaders, and NGOs who are all committed to educating students uh, for a diverse global society. Um, so we're really hoping to really take this idea of global education and turn it into implementable actions by bringing together stakeholders from all levels of the education system. Um, we have a great lineup of speakers, um, as Lucy said at the beginning, um, some, um, some which are, most of whom are confirmed. Um, so we have practitioner panels of, um, you know, practitioner, yes, the cost is 199 so I'm looking in the chat box, so it's, it's a small cost for a great conference. Um, as I said, we have practitioner panels um, of teachers. Uh, we have a teacher uh, from the Bronx, Tara Lewis, who has done amazing, inspiring things with her students. Uh, Principal Rick Swanson from um, Hingham in Massachusetts, who's done, again, great things in making his school um, a global school. And um, the District of the District of Columbia Public Schools, so DC Public Schools in Washington, DC, uh, the Global Education Director will be presenting there as well, um, along with a superintendent uh, from Vermont, all whom have really implemented and shown that global education can be done. Um, and then we also have thought leaders as well. Um, he'll be speaking um, at, in a second panel um, along with Ignite Talks. And then the afternoon will be full of workshops. You can actually kind of take this idea um, and begin to, uh, to develop action plans to take back for your schools while collecting additional resources that will help you. And I do see a question. In the field of global education, do you think that mainstreaming global ed into all subjects is more important than creating globally focused courses? Um, and I think that's a really great question. Um, I, I, I think it's a both and. Um, so I think mainstreaming global education into all subjects is first and foremost an equity issue. So when you're integrating global content and perspectives into all subject areas, you're making sure that every single student has access to that curriculum which is really important um, because, you know, I didn't talk about the beginning, um, but, uh, you know, our, our economy is very globally connected, um, and so if students, you know, aren't given those opportunities to kind of develop uh, these global competence skills, will be at a disadvantage in the marketplace. Um, but perhaps more importantly, right, from a citizenship perspective, um, it's so important that for us to get along with our neighbors, um, particularly people who hold different perspectives from us. Uh, it's just vitally important that every single student kind of develops these, um, these dispositions, knowledge, and skills. Um, the benefit, however, of having globally focused courses is that it is a dedicated space um, for ensuring that um, global learning is taking place. Um, and so schools, and perhaps there are, um, you know, teachers or school leaders who are in this, who are in this uh, session right now that can speak to it, a number of schools that do an excellent job of kind of going global have both. So they integrate global content into all their classes, but they also have opportunities for specific courses as well, um, either, you know, as part of social studies as a global studies unit or um, as an elective. But I do think that by integrating it across all subjects, um, you're ensuring that every single student um, has access to a globally focused curriculum. So any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much. Um, and please feel free um, to reach out and contact me um, at any time. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. You can send me an email. Um, I'll be sure to type in my, con my contact um, information as well um, into the chat box. Um, so I really appreciate um, you taking time out of your morning, afternoon, or evening uh, to listen 
Um, and I just implore you uh, to really think about what that next step is that you can take uh, to improve your own globally competent teaching practices um, in the, the globally competent teaching practices of the educators with whom you work. Uh, so thank you so much. Thanks, Ariel. Terrific job. Thanks, folks, for coming. You've got a five-minute break before the next set of sessions. Please uh, look at the schedule and see if there's something you're interested in. We're going to close this room out now. The recording will be up in about 10 or 15 minutes. The full Blackboard Collaborate recording, the MP3 and MP4 versions will be up later. In the full Blackboard Collaborate version, you can still download the slides and or the chat. So know that for all of the sessions, it's a neat feature. Thanks, Ariel. Take care. Thank you.